The book of Genesis is not short on controversy, and one of the most controversial figures emerges in the narrative in Genesis chapter 14. Genesis 14, starting in verse 18, says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. That's all we get. Melchizedek bursts into the narrative and then disappears as quickly as he emerged. We're given a little bit of information about him, and then we don't hear anything about him again until more than 400 years later when King David writes a messianic psalm in Psalm 110. King David writes in Psalm 110, verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. These two verses contain all of the information that we have about this shadowy figure. And as a result of that, many people speculate and get in debates and arguments about just who Melchizedek actually is. In the New Testament, the author of the book of Hebrews once again brings up Melchizedek and has an awful lot of conversation about him and how this particular passage is telling us about the glory of who Christ is. And in particular, as we understand that Jesus told us that Moses and the prophets and the Psalms bore witness to the fact that the Christ would suffer, that he would rise again from the dead, that he would enter into his glory and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. In particular, this figure serves as a type helping us to understand that the Christ would enter into his glory. Keep in mind the original context when Moses was writing All of this that he's recording in the book of Genesis happens before Moses was even born. This is before he went to Mount Sinai and and received the Ten Commandments. This is before David and the monarchy had begun in the nation of Israel when they were dwelling in the Promised Land. When the Old Covenant came into effect, we saw that the king and the priests were separated. The kingly line came from the line of Judah, and the priests came from the descendants of Levi, two separate tribes in the nation of Israel. And yet, what we see here in Genesis 14 is that Abram, before these covenant promises have fully been enacted, before the the old covenant or the Mosaic covenant is put into place, that Abram encounters a figure, a king of Salem which the author of Hebrews tells us, if we translate that, that's the king of peace, whose name is Melchizedek, which once again translated is the king of righteousness. He is a priest of the most high God, and he is also a king. When David then appeals to this imagery, even though it's very short, this was included by Moses so that David in his messianic prophecy could appeal to this, saying that a time was coming in the new covenant when the king and the priest would no longer be separate individuals, but they would be united in one person. As the Christ entered into his glory, he entered in as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and as a high priest for his people forever. Often we think about what Christ did on the cross, and rightly so. It is wonderful to think about him suffering and dying and rising again in victory over sin, death, and hell. But sometimes we fail to recall that Christ is still alive, that he has ascended to his rightful place, and he's taken his seat at the right hand of the Father on high, where he daily lives to make intercession for his people as the great high priest of our faith. In the Old Covenant, the nation of Israel was separate from all the surrounding nations, and most of the surrounding nations often combined the offices of king and priest together. While Melchizedek might be shadowy for many of us, in fact, for most of those living in those days, who Melchizedek was wasn't all that out of the ordinary. You can think of many people in history that united the offices of what we would call a priest, someone who intercedes with the God or gods on behalf of the people and vice versa, and also who rules as king. The pharaohs in Egypt were themselves worshipped as gods, and they ruled as king of the people. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, was likewise someone who united the king and the priestly office into one person. 
The Old Covenant was unique amongst the nations that surrounded them in separating those into two individuals so that no individuals would be ascribed undue glory, which was due to God alone. As the king ruled in the name of God and as the priests served in the name of God, all of these things were kept separate so that no individual would receive undue glory, honor, and praise. And yet, when King David, in, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, appealed to this shadowy figure, who is shadowy to us simply because we don't know much about him, he was declaring that in the new covenant to come, the Messiah, the Christ, as he entered into his glory, would enter into this glorious position as both king and priest forever. There would be no need for a succession plan. There would be no need for others to serve in these ministries as well. Because in the one person, Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ, as he entered into his glory, he would fulfill this glorious promise. The Christ was proclaimed to be both a king and priest forever. And this is fulfilled in the person, Jesus of Nazareth. We can have hope and glory when we trust in him, when we appeal to him, knowing that there is no authority higher and that he serves forever as a high priest who can relate to us in our weakness because he himself was made a man, although he himself was without sin, and that he is able to save forever those who call on his name. Thanks for watching, everybody. Don't forget to click that thumbs up button if you like this video and consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell so you won't miss any of our future videos.